Welcome to the online course on the Nibbana Sermons 12 to 22 by Bhikkhu Katakurunda Nyanananda, a collaboration between the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg and the Barra Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we will be looking at sermon number 17. But before that, I wanted to again pick out a few things from the, as always, very interesting discussion on the online forum. There were several comments related to the Bahia instructions from a very practical viewpoint. Robert Hayward said that <clears throat> on retreat, I have tried to practice it maybe with a little success. My experience was that by staying simply with the arising sense impression and not moving beyond it into labeling, evaluation and subsequently papancha, that there was a significant impact on the perceptual situation. So for example, in looking at a tree, the notions of tree, branches, green, etc. are dropped and consequently no object and hence no subject is invoked. Perceptually, my experience was that there was a collapsing of depth in perception, so that experience became increasingly two rather than three-dimensional. Then he asks, uh, he comments also that, I find I am far less effective off retreat, where there is more stimulation and a reduction of mindfulness. Has anyone successfully maintained a Bahia perspective in everyday life? Yeah, I think this is an important question and also the whole issue whether in the scene, just the scene really means also to drop any kind of concept or just the proliferation of concepts. And Katrina said, sometimes even when I'm not practicing in a particular way, the practice sort of jumps into my waking dream experience. And so she gives a practical example when in one case, for example, she was able to see quite vividly an example of the proliferative process of the mind. And I think this is what uh, uh, I, we can really see in daily daily life practice to, to catch that proliferating uh, tendency. Robert Grosch, it is fascinating to see the mind running after some things with craving and running away from other things with aversion, while conceptually knowing at the same time that this is all just due to imagining. Yeah, and this is uh, another, uh, I think, interesting dimension also to explore in daily life that, that we see the reactivity and we are at least conceptually aware that what it is based on is really empty. And over time, that understanding will simply diminish that reactivity. George Olayer, he comments that remembering, remembering across the day to drop into bare awareness a la Bahia entails an intentional stepping back from participating to witnessing, so to speak. A hallmark of that step back for me in visual field is a wide angle lens, panoramic. Visual organ, visual object, contact, full stop. And it is perhaps a little taste of the vacant gaze, disengaged, disenchanted from papancha. And this, I, I relate to that very much, this idea of witnessing and stepping back and the wide angle lens. And then a uh, last comment by Justin Brown. One aim of bare awareness could be simply to walk away from the perception of self. Yeah, and that's the key point. The, the, the issue of, of, of emptiness. I think I want to follow this uh, up uh, with another paper. I mentioned earlier that I uh, I'm writing one paper on the Bahya instruction from the viewpoint of the Malankya Putta Sutta, which gives like a detailed exegesis on the Bahya instruction. But I would also like to follow it up a little bit more from the viewpoint of the way how the mind constructs our experience and how this uh, 
seeing that proliferating tendency of the mind for what it is and uh, realizing its empty nature, even sometimes when the proliferation continues, uh, can help us to become more aware of the degree to which we construct things that appear to be out there. And with that construction always come, of course, different biases and stereotypes. And how I think in the Zen and Chan tradition, they have this about this sense of doubt. And this is a doubt in a positive uh, sense, not the doubt as a hindrance of the mind, but the sense of, uh, is it really the way it looks to me? Say, uh, anger, so-and-so has done such and such a thing. Are these people, or whoever it is, are they really as bad as I tell myself they are, I make myself see and hear they are? This kind of sense of doubt is another way how I believe this in the scene, just the scene instruction can be brought into daily life by simply trying to come back to what is actually really there. But in some way, it has to be a form of practice that does not just uh, require staying completely free from concepts, because without any concepts, we won't function. Uh, we won't be uh, able by a head still to, 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 to walk around and, and, I don't know, talk and, and think. So it has to be something that does not render us dysfunctional. Good, then, uh, Sermon 17. Itang santang itang panitang yadidang sabu sankara samato sabu pari pari nisago tanakayo virago nirudho nibbanang. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the Most Venerable Great Preceptor and the assembly of the Venerable Meditative Monks, this is the 17th sermon in the series of sermons on Nibbana. In our last sermon, we try to analyze some discourses that give us a clue to understand what sort of an experience an Arant has in his realization of the cessation of existence in the Arahata Pala Samadhi. We happen to mention that the Arahant sees the cessation of existence with a deeply penetrative vision of the void that may be compared to a gaze that knows no horizon. We also dropped the hint that the non-manifestative consciousness, endless and lustrous on all sides, we had spoken of in an earlier sermon, is an explicit reference to this same experience. How the Arahant, ranging in his triple pasture of the sinus deliverance, the undirected deliverance and the void deliverance, Animitta Vimokka, Appanihita Vimokka and Sunyata Vimokka, gets free from the latency to perception, transcends the duality of form and formless, and crosses over this ocean of existence unhindered by Mara, has been described in various ways in various discourses. Let us now take up for discussion in this connection three significant verses that are found in the Itti Vuttaka. Yecha rupu pagasatta, yecha arupa thayinu, nirodhang apajananta, arantaro punabhavang. Yecha rupi parinyaya, arupe su asantita, nirode ye vimodhanti, te jana machu hainu. Kayena amatang dhatung, pusa yitva nirupa ding, upari padinisak gang, sanjikatva anasabo, dese ti samma sambuddho, asokang virajam padang. Those beings that go to realms of form, and those who are settled in formless realms, not understanding the fact of cessation, come back again and again to existence. Those who, having comprehended realms of form, do not settle in formless realms, are released in the experience of cessation. It is they that are the dispellers of death. Having touched with the body the deathless element, which is assetless, and realize the relinquishment of assets, being influx-free, 
the perfectly enlightened one proclaims the soulless, taintless state. Comment translation by Ireland. Those beings who reach the form run, and those established in the formless, if they do not know cessation, come back to renewal of being. Those who fully understand forms, without getting stuck in the formless, are released in cessation and leave death far behind them. Having touched with his own person the deathless element free from clinging, having realized the relinquishment of clinging, his taints all gone, the fully enlightened one proclaims the soul a state that is void of stain. End of comment. The meaning of the first verse is clear enough. Those who are in realms of form and formless realms are reborn again and again due to not understanding the fact of cessation. In the case of the second verse, there is some confusion as to the correct reading. We have mentioned earlier too that some of the deep discourses present considerable difficulty in determining what the correct reading is. They have not come down with sufficient clarity. Where the meaning is not clear enough, there is a likelihood for the oral tradition to become corrupt. Here we accept the reading Asantita. Yecha rupi parinyaya arupe su asantita. Those who, having comprehended realms of form, do not settle in formless realms. But there is the variant reading susantita, which gives the meaning settled well. The two readings contradict each other, and so we have a problem here. The commentary accepts the reading asantita. We too followed it for some valid reason, and not simply because it accords with the commentary. However, in several modern editions of the text, the reading Asantita has been replaced by Susantita, probably because it seems to make sense prima facie. But as we pointed out in this series of sermons, there's the question of the dichotomy between the form and the formless. The formless or arupa is like the shadow of form, rupa. Therefore, when one comprehends form, one also understands that the formless too is not worthwhile settling in. It is in that sense that we brought in the reading asantita in this context. Those who have fully comprehended form do not depend on the formless either, and it is they that are released in the realization of cessation. They transcend the duality of form and formless, and, by directing their minds to the cessation of existence, attain emancipation. In the last verse it is said that the Buddha realized the relinquishment of assets, known as Nirupadi, the assetless. It also says that he touched the deathless element with the body. In a previous sermon we happen to quote a verse from the Udana, which had the conclusive lines, Touches touch one because of assets. How can touches touch him who is assetless? Comment. A translation by Ireland. Contacts affect one dependent on clinging. How can contacts affect one without clinging? According to this verse, it seems there is here there is no touch. So what we have stated above might even appear as contradictory. The above verse speaks of a touching of the deathless element with the body. One might ask how one can touch when there is no touch at all. But here we have an extremely deep idea, almost a paradox. To be free from touch is in itself the touching of the deathless element. Comment? Yeah, the point the Venerable makes is, I think, a very important one. And I wanted to just add that uh, the Cayenne, the instrumental Cayenne, uh, often has a function of uh, meaning with one's whole being. So when it says Cayenne Amatangda Tung Pusa Yitva, having touched with the body the deathless element or we might even translate as having touched with one's whole being and the 
touching itself is uh, particularly significant and we will come back to that later again in the sense that this touch here is of that which is the cessation of contact or touch and this is similar to the term ayatana which we will take up later in this sermon and so my I would say ayatana is a dimension of experience and so the experience of nibbana the ayatana of nibbana is at the same time the cessation of the six normal dimensions of experience and contact or touch contact i prefer contact is the event of experience and so the with one's whole being one has contact with the death element which is the cessation of the six normal types of contact and i think this is uh, both of these ways of expressing clearly point to the nirvana experience as something that is not just an absence so the nirvana experience is not just like being unconscious which would be just the stopping of the six sense fairs or the stopping of any contact at the same time it's totally apart from um, the six normal avenues of experience through the ayatanas the six types of contacting experience through the six senses end of comment what we mean to say is that <clears throat> as far as the fear of death is concerned here we have the freedom from the pain of death and in fact the freedom from the concept of death itself the buddha and the arahants <clears throat> With the help of that wisdom, while in that Arata Palasamadi described as Anasava, Cheto Vimoti, Panya Vimoti, or Akoppa Cheto Vimoti, let go of their entire body and realize the cessation of existence, thereby freeing themselves from touch and feeling. That is why Nibbana is called a bliss devoid of feeling, Avidaita Sukha. <clears throat> This giving up, this letting go, when Mara is coming to grab and seize, is a very subtle affair. To give up and let go when Mara comes to grab is to touch the deathless, because thereby one is freed from touch and feelings. Here then we have a paradox. So subtle is this Dhamma. How does one realize cessation? By attending to the cessation aspect of preparations. Comment, yeah, I think this uh, sentence uh, deserves a highlight. It is really a straight pointer at uh, that aspect of uh, insert meditation of vipassana practice which leads to the breakthrough how does one realize cessation by attending to the cessation aspect of preparations of experiences if you like end of comment as we have already mentioned to rise and to cease is of the nature of preparations and here the attention is on the seizing aspect the worldlings in general pay attention to the arising aspect they can see only that aspect. The Buddhas, on the other hand, have seen the cessation of existence in a subtle way. The culmination of the practice of paying attention to the cessation aspect of preparations is the realization of the cessation of existence. Bhava or existence is the domain of Mara. How does one escape from the grip of Mara? By going beyond his range of vision. That is to say, by attending to the cessation of existence, bhavani roda. All experiences of pleasure and pain are there so long as one is in bhava. The other hand wins to the freedom from form and formless, and from pleasure and pain. As it was said in a verse already quoted, atta rupa arupa cha sukadukha pamuchati. And then from form and formless, and from pleasure and pain, is he freed? Comment here, translation by Ireland. Then he is freed from form and formless, freed from pleasure and from pain. End of comment. We explained that verse as a reference to Arhata Palasamani. Here too, we are on the same point. 
The concept of the cessation of existence is indeed very deep. It is so deep that one might wonder whether there is anything worthwhile in Nibbana if it is equivalent to the cessation of existence. As a matter of fact, we, tam- we do come across an important discourse among the tents of the Anguttara Nikaya, when Nibbana is explicitly called Bhavani Rodha. It is in the form of a dialogue between Venerable Ananda and Venerable Sariputta. As usual, Venerable Ananda is inquiring about that extraordinary samadhi. Siya nuko avusu sariputta, bhikkuno tata rupo samadhi padilabo, yata niva pataviyang patavi sanyas, napas ming apo sanyas, natichus ming techu sanyas, navayas ming bayo sanyas, na akasa nancha yatane akasa nancha yatana sanyas, na vinya nancha yatane vinya nancha yatana sanyas, Na kinchanya yatane kinchanya yatana sanyas na niva sanya na sanya yatana niva sanya na sanya yatana sanyas na ida loke ida loke sanyas na para loke para loke sanyas sanye chapanas could there be friend sariputta for a monk such an attainment of concentration wherein he will not be conscious of earth and earth nor of water and water nor of fire and fire nor of air in air, nor will he be conscious of the sphere of infinite space in the sphere of infinite space, nor of the sphere of infinite consciousness in the sphere of infinite consciousness, nor of the sphere of nothingness in the sphere of nothingness, nor of the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, nor of this world in this world, nor of a world beyond in a world beyond, and yet he will be conscious. Comment translation by Bikabodhi. Friend Sariputta, could the bhikkhu obtain such a state of concentration that he would not be percipient of earth in relation to earth, of water in relation to water, of fire in relation to fire, of air in relation to air, of the base of the infinity of space in relation to the base of the infinity of space, of the base of the infinity of consciousness in relation to the base of the infinity of consciousness, of the base of nothingness in relation to the base of nothingness, of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, in relation to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, of this world in relation to this world, of the other world in relation to the other world, but he would still be percipient. End of comment. When Asariputta's reply to it is, there could be friend Ananda. Then Venerable Ananda asks again, but then friend Sariputta, in which manner could there be such an attainment of concentration for a monk? At that point, Venerable Sariputta comes out with his own experience, revealing that he himself once attained to such a samadhi when he was at Andavana in Savati. Venerable Ananda, however, is still curious to ascertain what sort of perception he was having when he was in that samadhi. The explanation given by Venerable Sariputta in response to it is of utmost importance. It runs, Bhavani rodho nibbanam, bhavani rodho nibbanam tiko me avusu anyava sanya upanjati, anyava sanya nirunjati. Seya tapi avusu sakali kagis jayamanas anyava achi upanjati, anyava achi nirunjati. Eva meva ko me avusu bhavani rodho nibbanam, bhavani rodho nibbanam ti, anyava sanya upanjati, anyava sanya nirunjati. Bhavani rodo nibbanam sanyi chipanahang avusu tasming samaye ahusu. One perception arises in me, friend. Cessation of existence is nibbana. Cessation of existence is nibbana. And another perception fades out in me. Cessation of existence is nibbana. Cessation of existence is nibbana. Just as, friend, in the case of a twig fire, when it is burning, one flame arises and another flame fades out. Even so, friend, one perception arises in me. Cessation of existence is Nibbana. Cessation of existence is Nibbana. And another perception fades out in me. Cessation of existence is Nibbana. Cessation of existence is Nibbana. At that time, friend, I was of the perception. Cessation of existence is Nibbana. Common translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. One perception arose and another perception ceased in me. The cessation of existence is Nibbana. The cessation of existence is Nibbana. Just as when a fire of twigs is burning, one flame arises and another flame ceases, 
So one perception arose and another perception ceased in me. The cessation of existence is Nibbana. The cessation of existence is Nibbana. On that occasion, friend, I was percipient. The cessation of existence is Nibbana. End of comment. The true significance of the simile of the twig fire is that Venabhasari Buddha was attending to the cessation aspect of preparations. As we mentioned in connection with the formula etang santang etang panitang, this is peaceful, this is excellent, occurring in a similar context, we are not to conclude that Venabhasari Buddha kept on repeating cessation of existence as Nibbana. The insight into a flame could be different from the mere sight of a flame. Whirlings in general see only a process of burning in a flame. To the insight meditator, it can appear as an intermittent series of extinctions. It is the outcome of a penetrative vision. Just like the flame which simulates compactness, existence too is a product of sankaras or preparations. The worldling who attends to the arising aspect and ignores the cessation aspect is carried away by the perception of the compact. But the mind, when steadied, is able to see the phenomena of cessation. Chittang vipamuttang vayanchan anupasati. The mind, steadied and released, contemplates his own passing away. With that steadied mind, the arahant attends to the cessation of preparations. At its climax, he penetrates the gamut of existence made up of preparations, as in the case of a flame, and goes beyond the clutches of death. As a comparison for existence, the simile of the flame is quite apt. We happened to point out earlier that the word upadana can mean grasping as well as fuel. The totality of existence is sometimes referred to as a fire. The fuel for the fire of existence is grasping itself. With the removal of that fuel, one experiences extinction. The dictum bhavanirodho nibbana clearly shows that nibbana is the cessation of existence. There is another significant discourse which equates nibbana to the experience of the cessation of the six sense bases, salayatana nirodha. The same experience of realization is viewed from a different angle. We have already shown that the cessation of the six sense bases or the six sense fears is also called Nibbana. The discourse we are now going to take up is one in which the Buddha presented the theme as some sort of a riddle for the monks to work out for themselves. Tasmatiya bhikkave seya yatta neviritabbe yatta chakkuncha nirudnyati rupa sanyacha viranjati Seyayatanavitambayatasutanchaniruntjati Therefore, monks, that sphere should be known when the eye ceases and perceptions of form fade away. That sphere should be known when the ear ceases and perceptions of sound fade away. That sphere should be known when the nose ceases and perceptions of smell fade away. That sphere should be known when the tongue ceases and perceptions of taste fade away. That sphere should be known when the body ceases and perceptions of the tangible fade away. That sphere should be known when the mind ceases and perceptions of mind objects fade away. That sphere should be known. That sphere should be known. Comment. Translation by Bikabodi. Therefore, because that base should be understood where the eye ceases and perceptions of form fades away. That base should be understood where the ear ceases and perceptions of sound fades away. That base should be understood where the mind ceases and perceptions of mental phenomena fades away. That base should be understood. And here I've given the Chinese very similar. End of comment. 
There's some peculiarity in the very wording of the passage when it says, for instance, that the eye ceases, chakkunchani rujjati, and perceptions of form fade away, rupa sanya chaviranjati. As we once pointed out, the word viraga, usually rendered by detachment, has a nuance equivalent to fading away or decoloration. Here that nuance is clearly evident. When the eye ceases, perceptions of form fade away. The Buddha is enjoining the monks to understand that sphere, not disclosing what it is, in which the eye ceases and perceptions of form fade away, and likewise the ear ceases and perceptions of sound fade away. The nose ceases and perceptions of smell fade away. The tongue ceases and perceptions of taste fade away. The body ceases and perceptions of the tangible fade away. And last of all, even the mind ceases and perceptions of mind objects fade away. This last is particularly noteworthy. Without giving any clue to the meaning of this brief exhortation, the Buddha got up and entered the monastery, leaving the monks perplexed. Wondering how they could get it explained, they approached Venerable Ananda and begged him to comment at length on what the Buddha had preached in brief. With some modest reluctance, Venerable Ananda complied, urging that his comment be reported to the Buddha for confirmation. His comments, however, amounted to just one sentence. Salayatananyarodhanko avusa bhagavata sandhaya bhasitam. Friend, it is with reference to the cessation of the six sense fears that the exalted one has preached this sermon. Comment and translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. This was stated by the Blessed One, friends, with reference to the cessation of the six sense bases. And here I am giving the Chinese, which is again very similar. In fact, the uh, Chinese is also uh, interesting for this interlude with the, the Buddha leaving and then Ananda being asked. And there's a kind of pericorp description that every time when something like that happens, Ananda or any other monk will then tell the monks, well, you should have asked the Buddha instead of coming to me. And in the Chinese, this pericorp in this instance is uh, not found. And I think that is more fitting to the situation because if the Buddha makes only a short, short statement and then walks away, there's really no chance for the other monks to, to ask him. And so there's no reason to, well, blame is maybe too strong a word, but to, to tell them you should have asked the Buddha in the first place. And so I assume that simply because this description is so often found that in the course of all tradition, it also went into places like the pleasant one in the Pali version, where it is, doesn't really fit the context so well. End of comment. When those monks approached the Buddha and placed Venerable Ananda's explanation before him, the Buddha ratified it. Hence it is clear that the term Mahayatana in the above passage refers not to any of one of the six sense fears, but to Nibbana, which is the cessation of all of them. Comment here, yeah, this relates back to the point uh, made earlier about Hassa. So Nibbana is very clearly an Ayatana, even though it is the cessation of all six Ayatana, it's very clearly something that is being contacted, even though it's the cessation of all contacts. Yeah, end of comment. The commentator, Venerable Bunda Gosa, too accepts this position in his commentary to the passage in question. Salayatana Nirodanti, Salayatana Nirodo, Vuchati Nibbana, Tang Sandaya Basitanti Atto. The cessation of the six sense fears. What is called the cessation of the six sense fears is Nibbana. The meaning is that the Buddha's sermon is a reference to it. The passage in question bears testimony to two important facts. Firstly, that Nibbana is called the cessation of the six sense spheres. Secondly, that this experience is referred to as an ayatana or a sphere. And the fact that Nibbana is sometimes called ayatana is further corroborated by a certain passage in the Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta, which defines the term Nekkamasita Domanasa. In that discourse, which deals with some deeper aspects of the Dhamma, 
The concept of Nekamasita Dumanasa or unhappiness connected with renunciation is explained as follows. If one contemplates with inside wisdom the sense objects like forms and sounds as impermanent, suffering fraught and transient, and develops a longing for Nibbana, due to that longing or expectation one might feel an unhappiness. It is such an unhappiness which, however, is superior to an unhappiness connected with the household life. That is called Nekkamasita Dumanasa, or unhappiness connected with renunciation. How such an unhappiness may arise in a monk is described in the discourse in the following manner. Kutnda sunam mahantak dayatanang upasampadja viharissami yat ariya etarahi ayatanang upasampadja viharanti. Iti anutaresu vimokesu piyang upattapayatu upampanjati piha pajaya dumanassang. Yang iva rupang dumanassang ilang bucati nekkama sita dumanassang. Oh, when shall I attain to and dwell in that sphere to which the noble ones now attain and dwell in? Thus, as he sets up a longing for the incomparable deliverances, there arises an unhappiness due to that longing. It is such an unhappiness that is called unhappiness connected with renunciation. Comment. Translation by Nyana Moli. When shall I enter upon and abide in that base that the noble ones now enter upon and abide in? In one who generates thus a longing for the supreme liberations, grief arises with that longing as condition. Such grief as this is called grief based on renunciation. And here is a translation of the Madhyama Agama parallel. When will I attain and dwell in that sphere, namely the sphere that the noble ones attain and dwell in? This is one's aspiration for the highest liberation. The frightening knowledge of dukkha and sadness gives rise to sadness. Sadness of this type is called sadness based on dispassion. And I have discussed uh, this kind of aspiration a little bit in an article called The Challenge of Pain and published very recently in the Inside Journal. And so we will make this available on the forum for reading for anybody who likes to follow up this particular point. End of comment. What are called incomparable deliverances are the three doorways to Nibbana, the signless, the undirected, and the void. We can therefore conclude that the sphere to which this monk aspires is none other than Nibbana. So here we have a second instance of a reference to Nibbana as a sphere or Ayatana. Now let us bring up a third. Atanti bhikkhave tadayatanam yatanta neva patavi na apo na techo na vayo na akasa nancha yatanam na vinya nancha yatanam na akinchanya yatanam na neva sanya na sanya yatanam na ayan loko na paroloko na ubo chandima surya tatra pahang bhikkhave neva gating vadami na gating na titting na chutting na upapatting. Appatitang, appapatang, anna rammanang evatang, ezi vantodukkasati. Incidentally, this happens to be the most controversial passage on Nibbana. Scholars, both ancient and modern, have put forward various interpretations of this much vexed passage. Its riddle like presentation has posed a challenge to many a philosopher bent on determining what Nibbana is. This brief discourse comes in the Udana as an inspired utterance of the Buddha on the subject of Nibbana, Nibbana Patisamyutta Sutta. To begin with, we shall try to give a somewhat literal translation of the passage. Monks, there is that sphere wherein there is neither earth, nor water, nor fire, nor air, neither the sphere of infinite space, nor the sphere of infinite consciousness, nor the sphere of nothingness, nor the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. Neither this world, nor the world beyond, nor the sun and the moon. The monks, I say, is no coming, no going, no staying, no passing away, and no arising. It is not established, it is not continuing, it has no object. This itself is the end of suffering. Comment translation by Ireland. This because that state where there is no earth, no water, no fire, no air, 
no base consisting of the infinity of space, no base consisting of the infinity of consciousness, no base consisting of nothingness, no base consisting of neither perception nor non-perception, neither this world nor another world nor both, neither sun or no moon. Here because I say there is no coming, no going, no staying, no deceasing, no uprising, not fixed, not movable, it has no support. Just this is the end of suffering. End of comment. Instead of getting down to the commentary interpretation at the very outset, let us try to understand this discourse on the lines of the interpretation we have so far developed. We have already come across two references to Nibbana as an ayatana or a sphere. In the present context, too, the term ayatana is an allusion to arata palasamani. Its significance, therefore, is psychological. First of all, we are told that earth, water, fire and air are not there in that ayatana. This is understandable, since in a number of discourses dealing with Anidasana Vijnana and Arata Palasamadhi, we came across similar statements. It is said that in Anidasana Vijnana, or non-manifestative consciousness, earth, water, fire and air do not find a footing. Similarly, when one is in Arata Palasamadhi, one is said to be devoid of the perception of earth in earth, for instance, because it does not attend to it. So the peculiar negative formulation of the above Udana passage is suggestive of the fact that these elements do not exercise any influence on the mind of one who is in Arata Palasamadhi. The usual interpretation, however, is that it describes some kind of a place or world devoid of those elements. It is generally believed that the passage in question is a description of the sphere into which the Aran passes away, that is his after-death state. This facile explanation is often presented only as a tacit assumption for fear of being accused of heretical views. But it must be pointed out that the allusion here is to a certain level of experience of the living Arahant, namely the realization here and now of the cessation of existence. <coughs> The four elements have no part to play in that experience. The sphere of infinite space, the sphere of infinite consciousness, etc. also do not come in, as we have already shown with reference to a number of discourses. So it is free from both form and formless. The statement that there is neither this world nor world beyond could be understood in the light of the phrase na ida loke ida loke sanyi, na para loke para loke sanyi. Percipient neither of a this world in this world, nor of a world beyond in a world beyond, that came up in a passage discussed above. The absence of the moon and the sun, the Ubo Chandima Surya, in this sphere is taken as the strongest argument in favor of concluding that Nibbana is some kind of a place, a place where there is no moon or sun. But as we have explained in the course of our discussion of the term Anidasana Vijnana, or non manifestative consciousness, with the cessation of the six sense spheres due to the all lustrous nature of the mind, sun and moon lose their luster, though the senses are all intact. Their luster is superseded by the luster of wisdom. They pale away and fade into insignificance before it. It is in this sense that the moon and the sun are said to be not there in that sphere. Why there is no coming, no going, no staying, no passing away and no arising can be understood in the light of what we have observed in earlier sermons on the question of relative concepts. The verbal dichotomy, characteristic of worldly concepts, is reflected in this reference to a coming and a going, etc. The arahant in arahata palasamadhi is free from the limitations imposed by this verbal dichotomy. The three terms apatitang, apapatang, and anaramanang, not established, not continuing, objectless, are suggestive of three doorways to deliverance. Apatitang refers to apanita vimokka, undirected deliverance, which comes through the extirpation of craving. Apavatang stands for sunyata vimokka, the void deliverance, which is the negation of continuity. Anna Ramanang is clearly enough a reference to Animitta Vimokka, the signless deliverance. Not to have an object is to be signless. 
The concluding sentence, this itself is the end of suffering, is therefore a clear indication that the end of suffering is reached here and now. It does not mean that the Arahant gets half of Nibbana here and the other half there. Our line of interpretation leads to such a conclusion. But of course, in case there are shortcomings in it, we could perhaps improve on it by having recourse to the commentarial interpretation. Now as to the commentary interpretation, this is how the Udana commentary explains the points we have discussed. It paraphrases the term Ayatana by Karana, observing that it means reason in this context. Just as much as forms stand in relation of an object to the eye, so the Asankata Dhatu, or the unprepared element, is said to be an object of the Aran's mind, and here it is called Ayatana. Then the commentary raises the question why earth, water, fire and air are not there in that Asankata Dhatu. The four elements are representative of things prepared, Sankata. There cannot be any mingling or juxtaposition between the Sankata and the Asankata. That is why earth, water, fire and air are not supposed to be there in that Ayatana. The question why there are no formless states, like the sphere of infinite space, the sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of nothingness, the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception is similarly explained, while asserting that Nibbana is nevertheless formless. Since in Nibbana one has transcended the sensual sphere, Kamaloka, the concepts of this world and the world beyond are said to be irrelevant. As to why the sun and the moon are not there, the commentary gives the following explanation. In realms of form, there is generally darkness, to dispel which there must be a sun and a moon. But Nibbana is not a realm of form, so how could sun and moon come in? Then, what about the reference to a coming, a going, a staying, a passing away and an arising? No one comes to Nibbana from anywhere, and no one goes out from it. No one stays in it, or passes away, or reappears in it. Now all well, this is mystifying enough. But the commentary goes on to interpret the three terms Apparittam, Appavattam, and Annaramana <coughs> also in the same vein. Only that which has form gets established, and Nibbana is formless, therefore it is not established anywhere. Nibbana does not continue, so it is Appavattam, or non-continuing. Since Nibbana takes no object, it is objectless, annaramana. It is as good as saying that though one may take Nibbana as an object, Nibbana itself takes no object. So this is what the traditional interpretation amounts to. If there are any shortcomings in our explanation, one is free to go for the commentarial. But it is obvious that there is a lot of confusion in this commentarial trend. Insufficient appreciation of the deep concept of the cessation of existence seems to have caused all this confusion. More often than otherwise, commentarial interpretations of Nibbana leaves room for some subtle craving for existence, Bhavatanha. Comment, yeah, this is true. But I would like to add that uh, we also need to take care of not going into the other extreme of craving for non-existence, Vibhavatana, and that uh, just as Nibbana is not any of the six ayatanas, but is still an ayatana, not any of the six passas, but still a form of passa, so the evident trend in the commentary is to promote ideas that can lead to some craving for existence uh, should be corrected without going to the other extreme, I think. End of comment. It gives a vague idea of a place or a sphere, Ayatana, which serves as a surrogate destination for the Arans after their demise. Though not always explicitly asserted, it is at least tacitly suggested. The description given above is ample proof of this trend. It conjures up a place where there is no sun and no moon, a place that is not a place. Such confounding trends have crept in probably due to the very depth of this Dhamma. Deep indeed is this Dhamma and hard to comprehend, as the Buddha once confided in Venerable Sariputta with a trace of tiredness. 
संकित को अहं सारीपुत्त धमंग दिशयंग विथारे नापि को अहं सारीपुत्त धमंग दिशयंग संकित विथारे नापि को अहं सारीपुत्त धमंग दिशयंग अन्य तारोच दुल्लभा whether I were to preach in brief Sariputta, or whether I were to preach in detail Sariputta, or whether I were to preach both in brief or in detail Sariputta, rare are those who understand. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Sariputta, I can teach the Dhamma briefly, I can teach the Dhamma in detail, I can teach the Dhamma both briefly and in detail. It is those who can understand that are rare. And the uh, Samyukta Agama Peral, the Chinese I have given here, is closely similar. End of comment. Then Venerable Sariputtan implores the Buddha to preach in brief, in detail, and both in brief and in detail, saying that there will be those who understand. In response to it, the Buddha gives the following instruction to Venerable Sariputtan. Tasmatiya sariputta evang sinkitambang. Imas mincha savinyana kekaye ahankara mamankara mana nusayana bhavisanti. Pahiddacha sabbanimite su ahankara mamankara mana nusayana bhavisanti. Yancha chita vimutting, panya vimutting, upasampaja viharto, ahankara mamankara mana nusayana honti. Tancha chita vimutting, panya vimutting, upasampaja viharisamati. Evanivo Sariputta Sikkitamba. If that is so, Sariputta, you all should train yourselves thus. In this conscious body and in all external signs, there shall be no latencies to conceits in terms of eyeing and mying. And we will attain to and dwell in the deliverance of the mind and the deliverance to wisdom, whereby no such latencies to conceits of eyeing and mying will arise. Thus, should you all train yourselves? Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Therefore, Sariputta, you should train yourselves thus. There will be no eye making, mind making, and underlying tendency to conceit in regard to this conscious body. There will be no eye making, mind making, and underlying tendency to conceit in regard to all external objects. And we will enter and dwell in that liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom, through which there is no more eye-making, mind-making, and underlying tendency to conceit, for one who enters and dwells in it. It is in this way, Sariputta, that you should train yourselves. And here I have given the Chinese parallel. <coughs> it's closely similar. Just the difference that already after the first part uh, it mentions the liberation of the mind, liberation by wisdom, and then again after the second part. So, but in terms of content, it's very similar. End of comment. The Buddha goes on to declare the final outcome of that training. I am Bhutchati Sariputta, Bhikkhu, Atnchechi Tanhang, Vavatai, Sanyojanang, Samma Mana, Visamaya, Antanga Kasi Dukkasan. Such a monk Sariputta is called one who has cut off craving, turned back the fetters, and by rightly understanding conceit for what it is, has made an end of suffering. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. He is called a bhikkhu who has cut off craving, stripped off the fetter, and by completely breaking through conceit, has made an end of suffering. And here's the Chinese, again is closely similar. End of comment. We find the Buddha summing up his exhortation by quoting two verses from a sutta in the Parayana Vanga of the Sutta Nipata, which he himself had preached to the Brahmin youth Udaya. We may mention in passing that among canonical texts, the Sutta Nipata was held in high esteem, so much so that in a number of discourses the Buddha is seen quoting from it, particularly from the two sections Attaka Vanga and Parayana Vanga. Now the two verses he quotes in this instance from the Parayana Vanga are as follows. Pahanam kamat chandanam domanasana chuvayam tina sacha panuranam kukuchanam nivaranam upekka sati sangsutnam dhamma takka pureja anyavimukkam pabrumi avijayam pabedanam The abandonment of both sensuous perceptions and unpleasant mental states. 
the dispelling of torpidity and the walling off of remorse. The purity born of equanimity and mindfulness, the thoughts of Dhamma forging ahead and blasting ignorance, this I call the deliverance through full understanding. Common translation by Bhikkhu The abandoning of both sensual perceptions and dejection, the dispelling of dullness, the warding off of remorse. Purified equanimity and mindfulness, preceded by reflection on the Dhamma. This, I say, is emancipation by final knowledge, the breaking up of ignorance. And here I'm giving there is a parallel to this verse actually in the Samyukta Agama. End of comment. This is ample proof of the fact that the Aratapala Samadhi is also called Anyavimokka. Among the nines of the Anguttara Nikaya, we come across another discourse which throws more light on the subject. Here, Venerable Ananda is addressing a group of monks. Atmcharyang abuso abbotang abuso yavanchidang tena bhagavata janata pasata arata samma sambuddhena sambadhe okkas adhigamo anubuddho sattanang visuddhya sukaparin davanang samatik kamaya dukkato manasanang attang kamaya nyayasa adhigamaya nibbanasa satchikiriyaya Tadeva nama chakkum bhavisati te rupa tanchayatanam no patisangve disati. Tadeva nama sotam bhavisati te sadda tanchayatanam no patisangve disati. Tadeva nama ghanam bhavisati te gandha tanchayatanam no patisangve disati. Socha nama jivha bhavisati te rasa tanchayatanam no patisangve disati. Sucha nama kaya bhavisati te pottaba tanchayata no parisangbe disati. It is wonderful, friends, it is marvelous, friends, that the exalted one who knows and sees, that worthy one, fully enlightened, has discovered an opportunity in obstructing circumstances for the purification of beings, for the transcending of sorrow and lamentation, for the ending of pain and unhappiness, for the attainment of the right path, for the realization of nibbana. Inasmuch as that same I will be there, those forms will be there, but one will not be experiencing the appropriate sense fear. That same ear will be there, those sounds will be there, but one will not be experiencing the appropriate sense fear. That same nose will be there, those smells will be there, but one will not be experiencing the appropriate sense fear. That same tongue will be there, those flavors will be there, but one will not be experiencing the appropriate sense fear. That same body will be there, those tangibles will be there, but one will not be experiencing the appropriate sense here. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. It's astounding and amazing, friends, that the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one who knows and sees, has discovered the achievement of an opening in the midst of confinement. For the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the passing away of pain and dejection, for the achievement of the method, for the realization of Nibbana. The eye itself, as well as those forms, will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that pace. The eye itself, as well as those sounds, will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that pace. The nose itself, as well as those odors, will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that pace. The tongue itself, as well as those tastes, will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that pace. The body itself, as well as those tactile objects, will actually be present, and yet one will not experience that pace. And here I have the Chinese parallel. So the statement here is actually made by Udai, who comes in a little bit later in the Pali. And then he quotes that, and then he also, but he asked the same question that he will be asking now in Pali also, whether somebody who has that kind of experience is conscious or unconscious. And Venerable Ananda clarifies 
that uh, is conscious and still doesn't experience any of these five sense spheres. End of comment. What is so wonderful and marvelous about this newly discovered opportunity is that, though apparently the senses and their corresponding objects come together, there is no experience of the appropriate sphere of sense contact. When Venable Ananda has described this extraordinary level of experience in these words, Venable Udai raises the following question. Friend, is it the fact that while being conscious one is not experiencing that sphere, or is he unconscious at that time? Venamananda affirms that it is while being conscious, sanyeva, that such a thing happens. Venerable Udai's cross question gives us a further clue to the riddle like verse we discussed earlier, beginning with Nasanya Sanyi, Navi Sanya Sanyi. It is in puzzling why one does not experience those sense objects, though one is conscious. <coughs> As if to drive home the point, Venerananda relates how he once answered a related question put to him by the nun Jati Lagaya when he was staying at the deer park in the Anjanavana in Saketa. The question was Yayang Bhantiananda Samadhi Natchabinato Natchapanato Natcha Sang Sang Sak Sankara Nigaiha Vari Devato Pimuttata Titto Titata Santusito Santusitatta no paritasati. Ayang bandha samadhi king palovutto bhagavata. That concentration, Manavalananda, which is neither turned towards nor turned outwards, which is not a vow constrained by preparations, one that is steady because of freedom, contented because of steadiness, and not hankering because of contentment, when we serve with what fruit has the exalted one associated that concentration? Comment translation by Bikobodi. Bhante Ananda, that concentration that does not lean forward and does not bend back, that is not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing. By being liberated, it is steady. By being steady, it is content. By being content, and one is not agitated. Bhante Ananda, what did the Blessed One say this concentration has as its fruit? And here it speaks of the signless concentration. It's explicitly the signless. And then we get the same liberated being steadied and steadied and then just steadied being liberated. And then the, the question to Ananda, what is its fruit and what is its, its virtue? End of comment. The question looks so highly compressed that the key words in it might need some clarification. The two terms abhinata and apanata are suggestive of lust and hate, as well as introversion and extroversion. This concentration is free from these extreme attitudes, whereas in ordinary concentration sankaras or preparations exercise some degree of control, as the term vikambana Propping up suppression suggests, here there is no implication of any forcible action as in a vow. Here the steadiness is born of freedom from that very constriction. Generally, the steadiness characteristic of a level of concentration is not much different from the apparent steadiness of a spinning top. It is the spinning that keeps the top up. But here the very freedom from that spinning has brought about a steadiness of a higher order which in its turn gives rise to contentment. The kind of peace and contentment that comes with samadhi is general, is brittle and irritable. That is why it is sometimes called kuppapatichasanti, peace subject to irritability. Here, on the contrary, there is no such irritability. We can well infer from this that the allusion is to a kuppa chetovimukti, unshakable deliverance of the mind. The kind of contentment born of freedom and stability is so perfect that it leaves no room for hankering, paritasana. However, the main point of the question posed by that nun amounts to this. What sort of a fruit does a samadhi of this description entail, according to the words of the Exalted One? After relating the circumstances connected with the above question as a flashback, Venerable Ananda finally comes out with the answer he had given to the question. 
Yayam Bhagani Samadhi na Chabinato na Chapanato na Chasa Sankara Ningaiha Varivato Vimutata Tito Tittata Santusito Santusitata no Paritasati Ayam Bhagani Samadhi Anya Palo Bhutto Bhagavata Sister, that a concentration which is neither turned towards nor turned outwards, which is not a vow constrained by preparations, one that is steady because of freedom, contented because of steadiness, and not hankering because of contentment, that concentration sister has been declared by the Buddha to have full understanding as its fruit. Comment translation by Bhikkhubodhi. Sister, the concentration that does not lean forward and does not bend back, and that is not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing. By being liberated, it is steady. By being steady, it is content. By being content, one is not agitated. The Blessed One said, this concentration has final knowledge as its fruit. And then Bhikkhu Bodhi offers the following comment on this passage. In a footnote, I am Bhante Ananda Samadhi King Palavutta Bhagavata. The question is ambiguous. It could mean either of what did the Blessed One say this concentration is the fruit or what did the Blessed One say this concentration has as its fruit. Ayang Bhagini Samadhi Anya Palo Vutta Bhagavata The compound Anya Palo could be interpreted either as a tapurisa This concentration is the fruit of final knowledge or as a bahubhihi This concentration has final knowledge as its fruit. In the former case, the samadhi is to be identified with the fruit, in the latter with an achievement preceding the fruit. The commentary takes it in the former sense, as the fruit itself. The nun asks about the concentration of the fruit of aranship. Final knowledge is aranship. The Blessed One has spoken of this concentration of the fruit of aranship. The intention is, when one is percipient with the perception of the fruit of aranship, one does not experience that base. However, the question King Pala occurs repeatedly in the Samyutta Nikaya, where it must mean what does it have as its fruit. In one case, uh, Samyutta 5.25, we find Panchai bhikkavi ange anugahita samma ditti cha cheta vimuti pala hoti panya vimuti pala cha hoti. The sense here is not that right view is the fruit of liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom, but that right view has liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom as its fruit. Further in 301, a samani described in exactly the same terms as this one is shown to be the supporting condition for the six higher knowledges, the last of which is the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom. By analogy, it follows that this samadhi is not the fruit of final knowledge, but one that yields final knowledge. So here is the Chinese. It's just a repetition of what we had above. And that uh, the Wu uh, Xiang Xin Samme would be Animita Cheto Samadhi. So it gives a more uh, clear indication of what according to the understanding reflected in the Chinese version is the implication of this description of the concentration is not bent forward or backward and it's the signless, signlessness, concentration of the mind on signlessness, animitta. End of comment. Anya or full understanding is one that comes with realization conferring certitude and it is the fruit of the concentration described above. Then, as if coming back to the point, Venulananda adds, Evam sanye piko avo no Being thus conscious too, friend, one does not experience an appropriate sphere of sense. So now we have garnered sufficient evidence to substantiate the claims of this extraordinary Arata Pala Samadhi. It may also be mentioned that sometimes this realization of the arahant is summed up in a sentence like anasavang cheto vimutting panya vimutting didneva dhamme saying abhinya satnjikatva upasampanya viharati having realized by himself through higher knowledge here and now 
to the influx free deliverance of the mind and deliverance to wisdom he dwells having attained to it. There is another significant discourse in the section of the force in the Anguttara Nikaya which throws some light on how one should look upon the Arahant when he is in Aratapala Samadhi. The discourse deals with four types of persons, namely Anmusutagami Pugala, downstream born person, Patisutagami Pugala, upstream born person, Tittattu Pugala, stationary person, Tinno Pargato Tale Tittati Brahmanon, the Brahmin standing on dry ground, having crossed over and gone beyond. The first type of person indulges in sense pleasures and commits evil deeds and <coughs> is thus bound downstream in samsara. The second type of person refrains from indulgence in sense pleasures and from evil deeds. His upstream struggle is well expressed in the following sentence. Sahapi dukkena, sahapi dumana sena, asumo kopi rudamano, paripunnan parisundang brahmacharyam charti. Even with pain, even with displeasure, with tearful face and crying, he leads the holy life in its fullness and perfection. The third type, the stationary, is the non-returner, who, after death, goes to the Brahma worlds and puts an end to suffering there, without coming back to this world. It is the fourth type of person who is said to have crossed over and gone to the Farashwa, Tinno Paragato, and stands there, Tale Tittati. The word Brahmin is used here as an epithet of an Arahant. The real-like reference to an Arahant is explained there with the help of the more thematic description Anasavanang Kaya, Anasavang Chetavimutanting, Panyavimutanting, Dindeva Dhamme, Sayanga Binya, Sanjikadva Upasampanya Viharati. With the extinction of influxes, he attains to and abides in the influx free deliverance of the mind and deliverance to wisdom. This brings us to an extremely deep point in our discussion on Nibbana. If the Arant in Aratapala Samadhi is supposed to be standing on the farther shore, having gone beyond, what is the position with him when he is taking his meals or preaching in his everyday life? Does he now and then come back to this side? Whether the Arahants, having gone to the farther shore, comes back at all, is a matter of dispute. The fact that it involves some deeper issues is revealed by some discourses touching on this question. The last verse of the Paramattaka Sutta of the Sutta Nipata, for instance, makes the following observation. Nakapayanti napurekharanti dhamma pitesa napadichitase na brahmano silavatena neyu parangato napachititadi They, the Arahans, do not formulate or put forward views. They do not subscribe to any views. The true Brahmin is not liable to be led astray by ceremonial rites and ascetic vows. The such like one who has gone to the father shore comes not back. Common translation by Bhikkhubodhi. They do not construct. They have no preferences. Even the teachings are not embraced by them. A Brahmin cannot be led by good behavior and observances. The impartial one, gone beyond, does not fall back. End of comment. It is the last line that concerns us here. For the other hand, it uses the term tadi, a highly significant term which became across earlier too. The rather literal rendering such like stands for steadfastness, for the unwavering firmness to stand one's ground. So the implication is that the other hand, once gone beyond, does not come back. The steadfastness associated with the epithet tadi is reinforced in one Dhammapada verse by bringing in the simile of the firm post at the city gate, in the key rupa mo tadi subbuto, who is steadfast and well conducted like a pillar at the city gate. The verse in question then points to the conclusion that the steadfast one, the Aran, who has attained supramundane freedom, does not come back. Thank you for your attention.